great to be with you folks again today. And uh, we're going to be continuing our sermon series on what is God like? That's the question that Elvis Garcia and Clint Jones and myself have been discussing with you here in uh, our sermon series. It's been said that God is like General Electric. He brings good things to life. God is like Bayer Aspirin. He works wonders. God is like Hallmark Cards. He cared enough to send his very best. God is like Tide. He gets out the stains that others leave behind. God is like Dial Soap. Aren't you glad you know him? Don't you wish everyone did? God is like Alka-Seltzer. Oh, what a relief he is. God is like scotch tape. You can't see him, but you know he's there. God is like the copper top battery. Nothing can outlast him. I wonder, should I just go to the, uh, to the other mic here? We seem to be having some technical problems. How would this be? Better? Okay. Uh, God is like American Express. Don't leave home without him. God is like Coke. He's the real thing. God is like Ford. He's got a better idea. And God is like Allstate. You're in good hands with him. Well, today I want us to consider that God is merciful. And uh, let's read from Psalm 51 today. Verses 1 through 17. Psalm 51. There it is on our board. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Let's pray. Father, take your word. May this be the prayer of our heart today as we come to you for mercy, for grace, for forgiveness, for all that you have to offer us. Speak to us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a few more verses having to do with God's mercy that I'd have us read together, okay? So we put them up on the board there. First of all, Psalm 89, verse 1. Let's read this one out loud together. 
I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. How about Psalm 23, 6? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God is the God of mercy. This word mercy in the Bible languages could also be translated loving kindness, compassion, steadfast love. It's lined with the word grace. Today we look at a man greatly in need of mercy. His name was David, king of Israel. David is called a man after God's own heart. And yet he got caught up in this spiral of sin. In 2 Samuel 11 and 12, we hear this familiar story. It was the spring of the year, and uh, David had sent his army out to war, but he himself had stayed home that time. And uh, one evening, David got up and uh, was walking around on the flat roof of his house, his palace, and uh, looked down, and here was this woman bathing, and he quickly looked away, but then he took a second glance, and uh, a third, and by that time he couldn't look away. She was gorgeous. Who was this woman? He sent his messenger, oh, okay, he sent his um, messenger down to find out, and uh, she came, we're having all kinds of trouble today, aren't we? So, we'll go with another microphone here in a minute, but uh, the messenger came back with word that she was Bathsheba, the, the wife of Uriah, one of his soldiers. And so, uh, David sent for Bathsheba, she came to him, he laid with her, he violated her, and um, soon afterwards, Bathsheba sent news to the king, I'm pregnant. Oh, great. What would he do now? Well, he plotted this little scheme. He sent word to his army commander, Joab, to uh, have Uriah come home to him. So Uriah came and gave him a report as to how the war was going. And then uh, the king fed him well and uh, said, now you go home to your wife tonight. Sleep in your own bed, okay? But uh, Uriah wouldn't do that. And uh, the next day, David said, well, why didn't you go home last night? He said, well, how could I when the ark of God and the army of the Lord is out on the battlefield? I couldn't betray my fellow soldiers that way. Uh, he, he wouldn't do that. So uh, David tried again and fed him well and uh, sent him. He said, now you go home to your wife. I mean it. But he wouldn't. He slept in the uh, entranceway to the palace. Just wasn't working. So David uh, said, well, we're going to have to go to plan B. So David sent word to um, Joab, the army commander, put Uriah out on the front line and then withdraw from him. Leave him like a sitting duck. And that's what Joab did. And sure enough, Uriah was killed in the battle along with several other of the soldiers on the front line. Well, after Bathsheba had, uh, had gone through a proper period of mourning, uh, she came to, uh, David brought her to himself to be his wife. And uh, in time, she gave birth to their son. And David was thinking, oh, wow, I got away with this one. But after she gave birth, Nathan, the prophet, paid a little visit. And uh, Nathan told him this story. Well, there were two men. One was a very rich man. He had a large uh, flock of sheep. He had a large herd of cattle. And then there was this 
very poor man. He had one little ewe lamb. It was the family pet. And uh, the rich man had a guest come by to stay with him. And um, what did he do? Well, he didn't take one of his own uh, cattle or lambs. He, he, he stole the, the lamb from this poor man and uh, butchered it and fed that to his guest. Well, when King David heard that story, he was furious. And he said, that man deserves to die. And Nathan the prophet pointed a bony finger at the king and said, you are that man. What did King David do? Did he say, well, hey, you can't talk to me like that. I'm the king. Off with his head. No, David said, I have sinned against the Lord. And he basically threw himself on the mercy of God. And so we come today to Psalm 51, and it captures the essence of David's confession. And I'll have to say I've often prayed this prayer for myself. The psalm teaches us by example what we ought to do when we sin. And I have us look today at four insights from Psalm 51. The first insight, admit our sins honestly before our merciful God. Psalm 51, 1 and 2 again, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. David here admits his sin, his transgressions, his iniquity. No longer was he trying to hide anything. No more excuses. And then verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Psalm 32, another psalm, uh, may reflect this same episode of David's sin with Bathsheba. And in Psalm 32, 3 and 4, it says, And when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. This speaks of the heavy, uh, the, the sickening feeling that, that David had inside his gut. He admitted that he had sinned. And uh, his strength, well, well, before he admitted that, his strength was just sapped like the summer. Uh, he, he felt miserable. He felt weak. He felt uh, numb. But then in Psalm 51, 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified when you speak. Justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He says, Against you, you only have I sinned. Hadn't David sinned against Uriah? Hadn't he sinned against Bathsheba? Hadn't he sinned against those other soldiers that were killed because of him? Uh, but he says, Ultimately, God, I realize that my sin is against you. My sin is against you. Ray Steadman has said, Sin is an insult and an injury to God. And then we come to verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Is David just making an excuse here? Is he saying, well, I was born a sinner, so, you know, how can you blame me? That's just the way God made me. No, that's not what, God, what David is saying. He's saying, I am a sinner through and through. I am a sinner by nature and by choice. And in our church statement of faith, we hear this statement, we believe that all people are sinners by nature and by choice and are therefore under condemnation. We acknowledge that our sin goes far deeper than just the occasional mistake, just the uh, slip up now and then. No, we're all born with a sin nature. We're all born with this 
natural bent to sinning. And uh, we are sinful people in need of God's mercy and grace. The following prayer offers a satirical look at our shallow view of sin. This superficial prayer was uh, based on a modern overhaul of a traditional public confession from the uh, Book of Common Prayer. Here it goes. Benevolent and easy-going parent. Uh, we have occasionally had some minor errors of judgment, but they are not really our fault. Due to forces beyond our control, we have sometimes failed to act in accordance with our own best interests. Under the circumstances, we did the best we could. We are glad to say that, that we're doing okay, perhaps slightly better than average. Be your own sweet self with those who know that they are not perfect. Grant us that we may continue to live a harmless and happy life. And keep our self-respect. And we ask all these things according to the unlimited tolerances which we have a right to expect from you. Amen. Wow, what a lame excuse, huh, for a confession. It is true that God is merciful, but God's mercy is not the same as tolerance, okay? Uh, sin violates God's commands. God who is holy, God who is uh, moral in every respect. Uh, in the wake of numerous public confessions by fallen politicians, sports figures, and business executives, uh, in her book, The Art of Public Grovel, Susan Wise Bauer offers a helpful distinction. She says an apology is an expression of regret. I'm sorry. A confession is an admission of guilt, an admission of fault. I am sorry because I did wrong. I sinned. Paul Wilkes says, apology addresses an audience. Confession implies an inner change that, we will, that will be manifested in outward action. In other words, if we are true and sincere in our confession, we're going to change. We're going to repent. We're going to avoid that sin in the future by the grace of God, not in our own strength. We can't do that, but by God's help, by God's strength. Alex Murdoch was found guilty this past week of murdering his wife and son. I didn't hear any confession from Alec Murdoch. I think he's probably hoping that, you know, we'll, we'll retry this, you know, have an appeal on this one. He did admit to lying, but I didn't hear any confession of his guilt in the murder. Saw crocodile tears, but, but I didn't hear any honest confession of guilt. Let's learn from King David to come out clean in our confession of sin. Let us honestly, forthrightly admit to God and when necessary to others that we have sinned. Well, that leads us to our second insight, and I hope you're looking at your bulletin and, and filling in a few blanks here. Second insight, ask merciful God for forgiveness and cleansing. Now, will you read with me again Psalm 51, 1 and 2? Have mercy on me. Let's read it out loud. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Here, David appeals on the basis of God's mercy, his unfailing love, his great compassion. He has no legal leg to stand on. Uh, he has no merit of his own to claim. He didn't say, well, Lord, I've been, I've been pure and clean and moral 95% of the time. No, he could only say, 
Have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. He pleads, blot out my transgressions. In verse 9, he says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Write out, or white out, I should say, was a product developed in 1966. Uh, we're going now back to the old uh, typewriters. I hated those things because I was always making typos, you know, and it was, it, it was just such a hassle. But, but with the whiteout, you had to stop everything. Uh, you had to paint over the mistake, blow on it, wait for it to dry. Then finally, you could, finally you could um, go on and, and uh, keep typing your paper. Take me forever to type a paper. They came out with the self-correcting electric typewriters, but uh, still a hassle. Okay, finally they, they came out with the computers and the word processors and I, I make mistakes all the time, but I, you know, it's easy to, to just uh, change those. Well, John Ortberg says this, he says, now wouldn't it be great if someday down the road somebody invented self-correcting people? Wouldn't it be cool if there, if there could be a self-correcting husband or wife who would say something wrong and then just back up and say it over again. You know, you're just like your mother. Oops, let's go back, erase that, let's start over again. Wouldn't it be great if every spouse or friend or parent or child came with self-correcting technology? But the human race isn't self-correcting. In fact, it's self-destructing. But in His grace, God gave us one of His most amazing inventions, the gift of forgiveness. In a way, it's more powerful than whiteout. On the cross, Jesus not only covered sin, He also absolves it, pays the penalty for it, and removes it as far as the East is from the West. Uh, what a glorious truth. What a glorious truth. God completely blots out and removes our sin when we ask him. Verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, hyssop was a leafy bush used in the Old Testament sacrificial system. It was used to sprinkle either blood or purifying water associated with blood sacrifice in order to make people or things clean in a ceremony kind of sense. In David's prayer, he asked for complete, thorough cleansing of his sin, like a leper being cleansed of his leprosy. Uh, so David prayed to be cleansed of his sin, decontaminated, disinfected, I heard on the news the other night about technology uh, developed at Washington State University. Go Cougars, okay? Uh, it's this technology to, to wash moon dust off of spacesuits and so on. And this superfine moon dust can be really harmful to humans. Well, so it is. We need to be decontaminated from our sins. Uh, today we have the wonderful assurance that God will purge us and cleanse us thoroughly, completely, when we confess our sins to him. Well, that brings us to our third insight. Uh, trust merciful God for restoration. Will you read with me now verses uh, 10 through 12? <clears throat> Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, David prayed. Uh, David had been specially anointed by the Holy Spirit 
to be king over Israel, the people of God. And he remembered what happened when King Saul, his predecessor, uh, hardened his heart against God. And God removed from Saul that anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it rendered Saul incapable of rightly governing God's chosen people. Well, today it's a little bit different. Because today when we ask Jesus into our heart, the Holy Spirit comes in. He permanently indwells us. And we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We will always have the Holy Spirit. So we don't have to pray, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. But when we sin, if we do not confess our sin, if we go stubbornly ahead in our sin, then God might remove from us some of the blessing of his Holy Spirit, the joy, the peace, the leading, the, the strengthening of the Holy Spirit. God might withdraw some of that blessing from our lives. And so we would come to him humbly and pray, restore to me the joy, the joy of your salvation. <clears throat> a few years back, Gloria and I took a little day trip down to see Mount St. Helens. And we drove up to the um, <clears throat> Johnson Observatory and we had the view of that, that awesome crater that was uh, left by the 1980 explosion of Mount St. Helens. Were, were you around when that mountain blew? I'm sure some of you were. Remember it. Well, I was back in Detroit at the time in my first pastorate, but um, <clears throat> I heard about it from my parents who lived over in Ephrata. And that Sunday morning, you know, the, uh, as they came out of church, the street lights were coming on around town. There was this thick cloud of, um, of ash that enveloped the whole region. Jonah Davies, you were there. I know you saw this. And it was just eerie, it was spooky with that thick cloud of ash. One of the ladies in our church uh, tried to drive home to her farmhouse and uh, a mile or two from her house, she just couldn't go any farther, couldn't see. Uh, just had to leave the car on the road and walk the rest of the way home. Well, that was Mount St. Helens, and it was destructive. There was um, 300, <clears throat> or excuse me, 230 miles of timber that was destroyed uh, from, that, <clears throat> from, <clears throat> from the blast. <clears throat> and today you can still see timber laid out like matchsticks in the blast area. And the crater looks like a moonscape, barren. But, but new life has uh, been restored to much of that blast area. When you saw the movie, it explained how gophers and elk and, and uh, birds and so on drop seeds in the soil, and those seeds take root, and today there's a rich variety of wildflowers and, and grass and trees that are flourishing. Restoration is happening by the hand of God. Well, when we sin, God not only forgives us our sin, but he also restores to us the joy of his salvation. He brings back the springtime of our life. Uh, yesterday I was out on the deck with uh, my grandson Ben, and he was asking, Papa, why, why are the flowers and all still dead and brown? And I said, well, you have to remember, it's still, it's still winter time, okay? Spring hasn't come yet. But it will. And God restores to us the springtime again. And uh, I think of the prophet Joel, who speaks of God's restoring the wasted years that the locusts have eaten. And so it is that God is in the business of restoration, restoring our lives. And that brings us to our final point today. Thank and praise God for his mercy. 
Psalm 51, 12 through 15. Let's read that together. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be returned to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. There's another verse in Psalm 32, verse 11. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. As we come to the communion in just a moment, let's come with thanksgiving in our hearts. Praise, joy in our hearts. Let's come with deepest humility. In Psalm 51, 16 and 17, it says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a contrite spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In the Old Testament, uh, sacrifices were pleasing to the Lord. He wanted the sacrifices. Not that he didn't want them. They were pleasing to him, but only, only if they were offered from pure and honest hearts. The Bible tells us to obey is better than sacrifice. God wants our obedience before he wants our sacrifice. With obedience and deepest humility, let's offer to God a sacrifice of praise today. Well, what should we do when we sin? Let me close with just one more story told by Pastor Herb Vanderluck. Remember hearing him address us years ago at a pastor's wives retreat back in Michigan. But um, he tells this story. A Christian wife had a brief affair, and her youngest child was the result of that illicit relationship. She concealed it from her husband, but um, her guilt was just driving her crazy. Finally, unable to face him any longer, she told him to leave the house. And uh, when the woman came to see Pastor Herb, she was very distraught. And uh, Pastor Herb told her that she needed to confess her sin to God and also to her husband. She hesitated, but soon she was on her knees in prayer. A little later, she confessed her sin to her husband, who was a Christ follower. And, and as, he started to, as she started to ask forgiveness, uh, he took her in his arms and he said to her, I forgive you. I love you. I love our little boy just as much as if he came from me. Well, that family was restored and uh, lived happily in the Lord. Herb says this would not have been the case if she had refused to humble herself, repent, and confess her sins. I would make one additional point. The woman's husband was willing to show mercy and to forgive. In Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Jesus said, Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Our Heavenly Father is merciful. And we are to imitate our Heavenly Father, aren't we? He is merciful, so let's imitate our Father, when it comes to being merciful. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Happy, blessed, joyful are the merciful. May God fill us with his mercy. What should we do when we sin? Well, let's cry out to the Lord, Have mercy on me, O God. Let's honestly confess our sins. Let's ask God's forgiveness and cleansing. Let's trust God to spiritually restore our lives. And let's thank and praise him for 
his mercy. Let's pray. Father, we do pray now as we come to your communion table that you might, Lord, remind us again of our Lord Jesus. For you, Lord Jesus, loved us and gave yourself for us. You went to the cross. You shed your blood that we today might be forgiven, cleansed, and made whole. And so, Father, as we come to the communion table, may we come with humble hearts, grateful hearts, joyful hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.